You have to know what you're doing in order to do what you want. So how do you know if you're hurrying? How do you know if you're not slowing down? How do you know if you are moving too fast or thinking too fast or processing something too fast? Well, there's some signs you're gonna recognize. If you're moving too fast through, say, space, through your home or uh, on the street or at work, you're gonna notice sloppiness. You're gonna notice that you bump into things. Maybe you drop things. Maybe you have minor accidents. Feldenkrais talked about that, saying that when that happens, we are ahead. Our nervous system is ahead. It's a little step ahead. Hello, hello, beautiful ones. Good morning, good afternoon, how are you? So great to be here, welcome. Hi Nancy, good morning. Where are you in the world? Hi everybody else, who's here today? Welcome, welcome, good to have you. Hi ah, Boston, okay, we're not too far. I'm in Pennsylvania. And the birds are singing today, it's a beautiful day. It's sunny, blue skies, just a few clouds. Feels like spring is here. How is your heart today? How are you feeling? How is your body? How is your mind? What's in your mind? What's on your mind? I'm going to give a few minutes for people to arrive and then we're gonna start our session today. And if you're here for the first time, I wanna welcome you, and I would love to know if you're here, a brand new participant. And if you're coming back, thank you for coming back. I appreciate your participation and your attention so, so much. If you were here last week and we were doing some very fun session with relation to humor and how does it affect us in, in the sense of interrupting our anxiety and the body contraction that we feel sometimes when a trigger happens in life. Um, did you get to play with that during the week? Was it something that caught your attention that you went, oh, let me see if this works and then you tried it I was sharing it with some of my clients in my private practice and it was interesting to see how uh, going at an anxiety from the point of view of humor may not be that second nature and, and, and regardless it works. So if you were here, did you try it? Did it work? I'm curious to know. Nika, good to see you. Oh, ooh, so good. It's been a while, huh? Yes, so great. I'm excited to share this topic with you today, which is at the core of the work that we do. Yes, yeah, so nice to see you too. Wonderful. So if you're a first timer, I want to introduce myself. Welcome. This is a great pleasure to have you here today. I am Diana. I am on this platform for a few years already teaching and sharing from my experience with Feldenkrais, with meditation, with energy work, and presence. If anything, I would say the work that I do invites us to be more grounded, more present, calmer, with an open heart. And I define that as connection, connection to source, connection to self, connection to others. So the way I see my work and what I'm inviting you into today is to explore our relationships. And you may think, oh, but this is not exactly what I need. But if you think about it, we are always in relationship. We are in relationship, of course, with ourselves. We are in relationship with the environment, with others in the environment. Everything that lives there from animals to minerals to objects in our space. We are in relationship with the greater community of our neighborhood, our workspace, our career or 
environment that includes other people and the industry itself for, for you know what we're part of of which we're part of we are in relationship to our country and our continent and our whole planet so even if we go out to the greater expanse and say we are part of a global community and we are in relation to that we live in relation to that or we zoom in all the way to the most micro fractal expression of that which is our relationship with ourself with our breath with our body with our movement with our mind and our thoughts and consciousness that lives through us we are always exploring this dance of relationship and this is a very shamanic point of view that I'm inviting you to consider today this is something I learned very early on in my career. I am an anthropologist by uh, college education and I learned and I was fascinated with shamanic practices all around the world and what do they share, what do they have in common. And one thing that they have in common is this uh, relationship perspective, knowing that we are not separate, that we exist in the wider spectrum of nature, others, the whole planet. And why is this important for the team, for the theme that we're going to cover today? It's because when we think about the art of slowing down, which is the premise, the main topic we're going to explore, I want you to imagine that it's not an isolated event. It's not something that you can do even if you think of yourself as completely separate from anything else, which is not real. Because even if you think I'm just me and I am not in relation to anything in the world, you are still moving with yourself, with your organs, with your breath, with your body, with the pacing, the inner pacing of your thoughts and your emotions. So. It's almost a principle, it's almost a foundation agreement that we need to make that we are always existing in relationship. And this allows us to see this in, in, in a perspective that becomes now more fluid. Because once you are separate, you're one unity, alone and isolated. Once you're in relationship, suddenly you contemplate polarity or duality or a dance between two, me in relationship to something else that could be inside of me or outside of me. And by the very own nature of that two, the three gets created, which is the union between the two. So now suddenly we have a, a triad, a triangle. We have a, a principle of three, which is the, the one, one un, unity, the, the, the single unit, its duality or polarity, and by integration, the non-duality or the unity of the two. And I like to bring this perspective, which is not necessarily something I learned from Feldenkrais, but I learned along the way uh, in other uh, trainings that I took and practices that I learned and maintained because a lot of times we face our limitation, the resistance of feeling that I got this, right? Maybe because it's new, maybe because it's hard to practice, maybe because somebody else or everybody else is doing something different and it feels a little bit like countercurrent or counterculture to do something like, in this case today, slowing down. And if you think about it, from the point of view of separation, it makes it a lot harder to understand that even the smallest change, the smallest difference that you can feel will make an impact in your brain. We, the, the smallest contrast that you can perceive will make an impact. So the bigger your perspective, if you include more and more and more into it, it's easier to find that difference, that perspective. If you begin to notice, oh, uh, maybe it's hard for me to, to find this ease 
with myself, but maybe I can move in my surroundings in a different way and I notice the difference. Or when I am talking to somebody else, I can practice this and I notice the difference. Or I will try approaching my work or my study in a different way and I notice the difference. Yes, yeah? so the wider the spectrum is almost like you're looking at a bigger landscape, the easier it is to learn. Yeah? At the same time, when you notice contrast, when you say, oh, this is easy or this is challenging or this feels contracting or expanding, this expands my awareness, my perspective, you begin to map in your brain new areas. Remember, when we first begin learning, we are a wide open blank slate connected to everything and we begin to identify by contrast what is one thing compared with the other. We learn cold from feeling hot. We learn hungry from being full. We learn ease by challenge. Yeah, so beginning to map in this way no learning is useful because then you can recognize it again. It's not always new, no, you're not reinventing the will yourself every single time. So framing our work today this way, we are always in relation. We're gonna explore the art of slowing down in relation to different objects, including ourselves, And we're gonna look for the smallest little contrast, the smallest little difference. And we're gonna make that an important piece of information that we're gonna keep, we're gonna map. And then we're gonna find another one. And then we're going to find another one. And that's how we're going to grow the landscape of what does it mean? What does it feel like? Beginning to learn or even master the art of slowing down. So we're going to play with it in our body. We're going to play with it in our mind, in our thoughts. We're going to perhaps imagine situations and do visualization with this. And as always, I'm going to base it in a couple principles. Why first principles? Because we can always come back to them. So you may say, assuming that we're always in relationship is a principle, but it's not a Feldenkrais principle. So I'm going to add a couple principles we work with in Feldenkrais to add to them. If you're with me for the series that we started a few weeks ago, we're always working with some Feldenkrais principle and your understanding of this work is expanding. So one principle that allows us to master or at least get in touch with slowing down as an art, as beneficial, as useful, is the principle that when we reduce the input, it's an actual law, it's a physics law, but we take it as a principle, it's a foundational quality of the work. When you reduce the input, your capacity to sense increases. So I'm gonna repeat that and I'm gonna give you a few examples. I'm gonna give you a little story as well, so you can maybe relate to it by finding a story in your own life. The principle states that when you reduce the input, when you have less information to take in, your capacity to, f to sense increases and you're able to find more information uh, nuance in there. So let me give you an example. Imagine that you walk into a big stadium. Say you're going to watch a football game or a baseball game. And the stadium is lit up with thousands of fluorescent bulbs, these lights that are really, really bright that make the stadium look like it's daylight at night. And let's say a few of those bulbs go off. Now, there's so many bulbs that you probably won't notice the difference. If, say, a whole section of them up there uh, stops working, you won't notice the difference. Now, in a second scenario, you're invited to a dinner party and you walk into this house and there's a few candles, maybe a floor lamp, but for the most part, some dimmed lights and some candles. And you're suddenly now adjusting to smaller input. 
right? Compared with the thousands of fluorescent lights. And let's say you're walking and you sit in this corner of this room and suddenly one of the candles goes off. You will immediately notice, or if not immediately, soon after, right? You, you're more likely to notice, let's say, because to begin with, your sensory input was not bombarded, was not unmaxed uh, processing, yeah? Think about the fact that there's always thousands, maybe millions of bits of information thrown at us all the time, but we are only able to process a small amount of those, even though we have a supercomputer as a brain. So that law, which has a very complicated name, is called fechner bever law. You can look it up, I can type it if you need to, um, states that when you reduce the input, you're able to sense more. And when you are able to sense more, you can find nuance, distinction. You can find more contrast. If you find more contrast, you're able to learn faster. That's how we use this principle. Another good example that I use frequently is you are um, driving on a road for a long time, say a highway, and you're 70, 80 miles an hour. Translate to kilometers if you need to. Now, you don't get to see much around you because you're going so fast that things kind of fly by the sides of your face. Now, if you are able to now go take an exit and go into the country road, which I live um, by, so I see them often, is 25 max, the speed limit. Now, this gives you time not only to see um, what's around you, but also to see nuance in what's around you. You might be able to see homes and trees and leaves on the trees or animal life. Right, so you slow down, you are able to see more, take in more, and see differences, distinctions, nuances. Imagine now, let's make an example from my own life. Remember when I get to the live events really excited, which happens often because I'm a very enthusiastic, high energy person. And I speak really fast because I can speak really fast. Sometimes I think really fast. And if I'm throwing hundreds of words per minute at you, your ability to catch up with me and learn the minor distinctions of what I'm saying is probably less than right now when I prepare myself for this session by slowing down prior to turning on. Actually, I, I started a few seconds late today, intentionally looking for how can I deliver this in a slower way. So to begin with, I'm creating the frame, I'm creating the setup, I'm, I'm setting the table for us, right? To, to begin to digest things slower. Now, if you're a fast thinker, you might think, oh, this is a little too slow for me today. But for the most part, if you can adapt and adjust to the rhythm that I'm proposing today, it might feel a little easier to process, even if I'm sharing a lot of information, which I do every single session. So see if this example resonates with you. And imagine in your own life, all the times when you're super excited about something, or you're very nervous about something or in a rush and you dump, it feels like you're throwing out a lot of input to somebody that maybe it's a friend or a colleague or you need something done. And you can almost see the person back off and not be able to receive it, right? So those are very good examples because we see it immediately. Right? In the driving example, the lights example, there's another really cool example, which is imagine you're carrying a, a, a big old piano, like a baby grand piano, and a, a fly lands on the piano. You won't feel that. It's just, you're carrying hundreds of pounds and kilos, and then a fly, it's minimal. But if you're carrying a feather or a piece of paper, on your shoulder and a fly lands on it, you'll most likely feel it. 
right? So it's the same idea and it's visible, it's easy to measure. You could look at it and see the difference between driving fast or driving slow. Now, the art begins when we begin to now become more subtle with this and think, oh, maybe I can slow down the speed of my thoughts or the processing of my feelings or my breath. And now this is not visible in the same way. It's more invisible, not so measurable, and yet the effect is the same. So that's what we're going to practice today and talk about today. And I would love to hear in the chat from you if you have any examples of this. If by accident or by, by intention once you found yourself being able to do something that you usually run through, like my own example of my life, I rush all the time through dishes. I don't like doing dishes. So I do dishes as fast as I can. And I always have a problem with Thich Nhat Hanh, who's one of my spiritual teachers, who says the best place to practice presence and mindfulness is when you're doing dishes. Because you're doing dishes, there's nothing else for you to be doing that moment. That moment, that's what you do. And the next dish, and this dish, and this dish, and this dish. And my mind is usually thinking about what I want to do after. So I'm rushing through it and I'm thinking, but Tich, I talked to him as if he, if he was next to me. I said, why? And because this is my most important practice. Because I can be present for so many other things. But in dishes, I, I really have a hard time connecting, like he would say, to the soap and the warm water and caressing each dish. Now, once I was at a Thich Nhat Hanh monastery in upstate New York, and we were doing dishes together, and boy, it was really different, because everybody was in that attention, in that frequency. Everybody was really connected to, now we do dishes. So maybe you found one day by accident or intentionally practicing this, I would love to hear, and especially your inner sensations, because we're going to work with that. We're going to work with the, the template of the body and how does it change your experience of yourself and the world around you, like I said earlier, in relationship to the world around you, when you can intentionally practice slowing down, speeding up. Felling Grace would say, move fast without hurrying. Move fast. He was... <laughs> There was a famous story where he gets into a cab and he's running to get to the airport and he tells the cab driver, remember cab drivers? He tells the cab driver, get me to the airport fast, but don't hurry. And there's a difference. And we're going to explore the difference. And like in all my lessons, my Felling Christ or meditation or live sessions, we're going to take the concepts and put them through our heart and feel into them and move them into the body and integrate them. And even if you take one out of the many things you hear me say today, and you can do that, you can move it down the sifter of your heart and see what it feels like. Can you jive with this? That Can you make this yours? Does it feel like a yes in your, in your heart and move it into your body? Can I practice this? give myself an opportunity to practice it, that's way more sustainable, long-lasting, and beneficial than if you remember just by memorizing a thousand of the things I say, but none of that is made yours. So that's the invitation as well, is to integrate it into your body, your whole body, your whole self, okay? So now I'm going to read and see uh, what are the needs of the group and what are the shares? I would love to hear from your experience. What is this like? Hi, April. Kendra is asking me to type and probably that was the Fechner Bever law. Couple uh, Fechner Bever. I hope it's one, maybe two Bs. Yeah, look it up. It's interesting. It's interesting because we're going to apply it today to a number of things and you're going to feel it and it's gonna be fun you're welcome Nika 
I love wearing my noise cancelling headphones even when there's no noise around. The absolute silence is like a spa for my brain. Absolutely, that is so beautiful. And imagine that when we get to slow down, that noise cancelling is what you're offering your nervous system. That is a perfect example. You're being a noise cancelling device for your whole nervous system. And that's what it feels so good and so relaxing and so centering and peaceful. Nancy says, I went to a yoga center for a weekend and meals were silent. I was surprised by how, how much more I enjoy the flavors of the food. <laughs> Amazing. Same idea. I love it. So you slow down your mind, right? What happens when we are in silence? You notice. Well, I've practiced this often, so I, I notice a lot of space between my thoughts. But what do you notice when you're in silence? Sometimes the noise goes up, right? Because you're constantly rambling. But if you can be silent and offer yourself that space, the space between your thoughts, now your other senses are more present. It's, it's like when you close your eyes and you can feel, sense, pay attention to other things than when your eyes are open and taking in so much input, right? So your flavor, your the sense of taste was enhanced because you weren't busy with your mind and your, your speech. I love that. I love and need this because I rush through everything, even brushing my teeth, even though there's a two minute timer. <laughs> yeah, and look, it's not that we're practicing mindfulness, but it is a form of mindfulness. I don't like to pin it down to mindfulness because for me it's much more than mindfulness. I call it the art of being present to self as we slow down. But it is a form of mindfulness and it invites the question when you say I rush through everything, like you're sharing, you rush through brushing your teeth the way I'm sharing, I rush through doing my dishes. What are we running away from in that moment? So ask yourself that question. Yeah, there's really nothing else to do. I remember the same level, it's like a micro anxiety. When I was a young mother, I have two daughters and one of them is 10 and the other one is 13 right now. But when the first one was a baby, sometimes she was playing with a toy and very into that toy, but I was already excited about the next activity that I could you know, show her a book or show her this other toy or let's do this or do that. And even if I was, holding myself from doing it because I wanted her to enjoy what she was into in the moment, I would notice my own mind racing and, and thinking about what is the next thing we're going to do. But I was running away from that moment. Now, it may look like boredom. Yeah, it may look like I already got this, so there's nothing else here. So what else is next? And it's almost as if there's a gift there that we're leaving unopened. So see if this concept is something that you can understand and then put it through your heart and then we're going to practice it in your body. Imagine that in the moment where you're brushing your teeth or I'm doing my dishes or you have to wait for somebody doing something that you're feeling is too slow and you want to be doing the next thing. That is an unopened an gift that has a pretty bow and a pretty wrapper. And you're saying, no, 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 I'm not interested. I just want to see what's next. And if you just simply were to receive the gift and be curious about what's in it and open it without expectation, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised at what you can find there. Because much like when Nancy was saying, I was at a silent retreat and we were uh, silent meals in, in this uh, yoga weekend and the flavors were enhanced. 
That's a gift that you didn't expect. Yeah. So let's let's see if we can move this into our body. We're going to make a little practice out of this. And I'm going to ask you to work with your arms first, and then we're going to work in standing, hopefully a little bit around the space. So if you need to, we can create space around you where you are right now, making room if you need to move furniture around so that you have a little space where you can move freely your arms, okay, and your legs and walk around. So if you need to do that, please do that right now. April, I love that. And one of my teachers, one of my Feldenkrais teachers, she passed away. Her name was Ruthie Alon. Ruthie Alon. Uh, she was proponent of uh, the slow food way before it was a trend. And, and she was um, sharing with us that not only your body is able to release certain saliva and make easier the digestion of that food, but by eating a little slower, you move the food to the back where it becomes almost like a reflex to swallow a little less fast, right? You chew slower, you breathe as you chew, you release releasing saliva and helping your body digest that food, but also avoiding um, stopping or slowing down that reflex of chew, swallow, chew, swallow, chew, swallow. Like you're in some sort of desperate famine and you have to eat as fast as you can because there's not enough food to go around, right? So so you're, you're teaching yourself in that moment to not move as a reflex, to be intentional. And definitely you're going to savor that food better. I am guilty of this sometimes because I eat faster than I used to before before I had kids and uh, a career and things to do, right? When I was, I think, single in my 20s, way more into meditation and spiritual practice, I, I was able to expand time, which comes with slowing down, much easier than once the responsibilities begin, began to pile up in my own life. So now it becomes a practice. So I relate to you that slowing down as I eat is something I need to be reminded of. It doesn't come easily. Um, I don't know if you know, but I was born in Uruguay in South America. So it's a country that by itself has a different pace. It's a lot slower in every way. And growing up, there was a lot more, felt like a lot more, um, a lot less pressure to get things done as I experienced once I moved to the state. And with that pressure to be productive and do and, and advance and uh, get things you know, uh, manifested and you can say anything from career to house to money to things, material things, with that pressure or pos- comes also the possibility, right? So I see always the duality of it and as you integrate it, you say, well, this is wonderful. Now, can I use that? By that, what I mean is that in a country where there's less of that, there's also less possibility. That's the reason why I moved here, (laughs) okay? So it's not that I'm saying anything wrong with uh, your ability to do, to produce, to manifest, to have, to create. I love that. That's why I still live here. Now, can we do that? Can we have access to that and still do it in a way where you are not moving ahead of the present moment, but you're in the present moment. And that's the whole nut of this uh, art. That is the whole, um, it's the gold inside the, the, the lesson today, the golden nugget of the lesson is that when you are able to slow down, and we're gonna practice that in, in a moment, you become one with the present moment instead of you ahead of the present moment side note to that and how to realize if you're doing it because remember one of the first principles we work with we covered this a while ago is in order to do what you want you have to know what are you doing 
You have to know what you're doing in order to do what you want. So how do you know if you're hurrying? How do you know if you're not slowing down? How do you know if you are moving too fast or thinking too fast or processing something too fast? Well, there's some signs you're gonna recognize. If you're moving too fast through, say, space, through your home or uh, on the street or at work, you're gonna notice sloppiness. You're gonna notice that you bump into things. Maybe you drop things. Maybe you have minor accidents. Feldenkrais talked about that, saying that when that happens, we are ahead. Our nervous system is ahead. It's a little step ahead. Yeah, you miss a step on the stairs, you trip over things, you, you drop something, you're moving a little bit too fast. Our nervous system is a little sped up. Yeah. So now you recognize, oh, that's what I'm doing. Okay. Remember always when you notice something about yourself, we don't judge it. We don't become obsessed in trying to change it. We don't beat ourselves up for it. We actually do the opposite, which is accepting, compassionately, understanding as much as we can. Why am I doing that? Say you're rushing through the teeth or the dishes. What am I running away from? Or where am I trying to get at? Or whose pressure is this to get there so fast? And then you also understand why is it important? Why is it valuable to have a choice here and not do it this way only? So if one day you need to do something really fast, you can, which is ultimately what we win here. We're gonna learn how to slow down and make things really smooth and then we're going to speed them up until we make them really fast. Because that's at the other side of this. This is the benefit. But if you're only rushing, you don't have that nuance anymore. You don't have that ability to go slow or to go fast. You're only in a rush. Now we're going to break it down, take it into the body. You're going to be able to slow down and then make it faster and faster and faster and maintain the smoothness of moving slow. It's an old military principle that says slow is smooth, smooth is fast. You cannot make something smooth, really smooth, until you slow it down. But once it's smooth, once you know it inside and out, once you actually access the circularity of it, the round, soften the edges of it, you can speed it up as fast as you want. This is also in the martial arts. This is also in music. When you want to learn a piece of music, a melody, usually you slow it down and you repeat it a million times. And then you can speed it up and your body knows the fingerings and your, your vocal cords know all the different notes. But you don't learn it in that way with that precision by doing it very fast a million times. So the principle applies everywhere, maybe in sports, maybe in, um, there's a great book I recommend about this, which is called The Art of Learning. I'm going to put it here. The Art, my, one of my favorite books of all times by Josh Waitskin. Ah, typing. Okay, um, please take a look. And there's a chapter there called um, Slowing It Down, I think, which goes very on hand with, with this topic. And he explains why uh, he's a prodigy in many different disciplines, Josh Waitskin. First in chess when he was a young boy, then in uh, Tai Chi push hands, then Jiu Jitsu. Now he's surfing, e-foiling, and he describes how for him to master some of the Tai Chi movements, he would slow them down to the degree of more than a slow motion movie. And he would be able to play that movement in his head very meticulously and very precisely, and then be able to do it in like a second, okay? Hi, Angela, <laughs> so good to see you. What else is in the chat? 
when we are between meetings or people schedule meetings during your lunch break. Good, great, great, great. Yeah, April, and that's what I was saying earlier. We are in relationship to our culture. We are in relationship to our environment. And that will apply a certain amount of pressure. And at the same time, we don't have to. It's almost as if because you walk into a restaurant and everybody's on their phones as they eat, you don't have to do that. You can see the value of something else. You have choice. Right? Just because you're in a circle, uh, let's say, at work and you join a group and everybody's gossiping, you don't have to gossip. Right? So there's a certain amount of conditioning that is imprinted in us, but there's a lot of choice. And practices like this allow you to have more and more choice. So then you can recognize, oh, I'm going this fast because that's what everybody else is doing, but I don't need to. I have choice. Okay? Yes, AJ, great. I didn't see what you wrote. This is exactly right. So first is recognizing what is happening. What am I doing? What do I want to do? The second one, which is awareness. Yes. The second part would be or second step would be to know that we have choice and accept that we have choice, which takes us from victim state into empowerment. Say, oh, okay. Not because this is what I saw growing up is what I have to perpetuate. Not because this is what I was told I could do, it's the only thing I can do. So now we realize I have choice, I'm entitled, I deserve to be able to choose. This is my body, this is my life. Life is presenting you a menu, you don't have to have it all, or the, on, the same thing every time, or what your parents told, told you you could have. You can try something new in the menu, it's your choice. And then then most importantly at that moment how does it feel check in with yourself if i choose this today how does it feel and you recalibrate your choice until you find this is what feels best for me today because it's also like refresh daily it's not that you learn something and okay then i'm done it's always the same i know i'm set you're gonna have your preferences and as you continue to grow, you might find new choices within you that want to be explored and, and um, applied, that want to be exercised, okay? So let's make this a little practice, okay? And please continue sharing in the chat and I'll come back to it at the, at the end of the movement practice because I want you to really have an experience of this. So you can put questions, you can share, and I will, I will read um, again in a little moment, okay? So let's begin in sitting because it's easier, and probably you're already seated watching this, maybe. Um, sit with your feet uncrossed and your legs shoulder width apart. Why? Because we want to feel balanced, we want to feel grounded. Feel the difference if you put your legs together, so now narrow the stance, put your feet Instead of shoulder width, put them together and feel immediately how less stable you become. Cross one leg over the other. We love doing this. I do too. But feel how unstable you become. And now your body is not even. Feldenkrais said if you were to stand or sit on scales, like bathroom scales, your two sides would be on different weights. So we want to have our two sides on the same weights and we want to feel stable. So for that, I recommend shoulder width apart for your feet and cross your legs, okay? So now let's begin thinking and feeling into ourselves. You can close your eyes for this. Think and feel into yourself and observe what is your natural uh, rhythm right now? What is your natural pace right now? Do you feel that because we've been talking for a while and I already set the pace of the session that we are in a more or less slow pace right now? Or do you feel that you're still a little running inside your thoughts, maybe some emotions or feelings? So if you were to describe to yourself right now on a scale of say one to 10, what is your pace? What is your rhythm like? 
look at it in terms of rhythm because nature is rhythmic so we want to move with nature we want to use nature to learn from we are in relationship with nature so right now i would say i'm feeling myself at a at a five or a six i'm still like on delivery mode i'm i'm thinking a little bit so i'm not perfectly slow at all i could be slower my rhythm could be a little slower and now put a hand on your heart if you can just close your eyes and hear listen to with your palm pay attention to the rhythm of your heart and notice we're not changing we're not judging we're simply observing how fast how slow and measure more or less in a scale of one to ten my heart is I've, I've felt my heart beat a lot faster when I've done cardio or something, so I can say my heart is at a pretty medium pace right now. And now see if you can let go of that and check in with your thoughts. Are thoughts running and galloping there or are they moving? at a slower pace and can you find any space between your thoughts where you're not thinking any thought or you're simply in silence and this is a practice one that I really enjoy and I teach so I can say for that, I feel that I'm very slow. I can find complete space and be empty, not knowing what the next thought is going to be like. I, I work a lot in surrendering the need to know what I'm going to say next. So it's, it's present, fresh, everything I'm saying right now, I don't know what's going to happen next. Okay, so now you have a baseline. This is where we start, right? And we're going to go for another, say, 10 minutes, 15 minutes with a little movement practice. Now I'm going to ask you to take out your hands to the sides of your body. If this is really hard uh, to do, you can do them lower if, if it's hard for your shoulder. And I'm going to ask you to uh, lift your arm up higher as if you want to touch the ceiling and move it down. And now do the same movement again, but pretend you're going to say, scratch your head in the back and put it down. And do it with your dominant arm. This arm knows speed. So very efficiently lift your arm as if you're going to raise your hand. Scratch your head, functional movement. Maybe imagine you're going to wash your face or put cream on your face, right? Something you probably do every day. And do it in a speed that feels like life, right? We're not working on this yet. We're simply observing. If I say, and I have a private practice of a lot of people online and in person, and I say, raise your arm, most people do that, right? We are used to that. This is, this is common. It's me, 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 me. Okay. Great, so that's baseline, right? And feel, if you can close your eyes and do it again, what can you tell about that movement? How does it feel? You raise your arm, you scratch your head, you wash your face, right? Probably a repetitive movement. So now we're gonna put the right arm to rest and if you're left-handed, you were working with your left hand, um, Many of us are right-handed, so put the right arm to rest and think now we're going to move the left arm, but we're going to invite some Feldenkrais into this so you feel a little difference. Framing into the beginning of the session, I hope you are here. We're looking for a small difference that we can detect, some contrast. We're looking to reduce the input 
so we can sense more. And we want to know what are we doing so we can do what we want. So what are we doing is the right arm, right? We're lifting our hand, we're scratching our head, we're washing our face, daily movements. What do we want to do is we want to learn the art of slowing down and make it so smooth that then we can do it fast and maintain that smoothness. Because what happens when you lift your arm that fast is you're not really feeling much and you may even throw your shoulder out. You may even experience pain from that, from that speed. What happens when you're washing your face that fast or automatically is you're not really present in that moment. Maybe you're not sensing as much. But also you are allowing the one side of your brain to keep getting stronger and more and more dominant, more and more asymmetric. You're wearing and tearing your joints. You're less able to sense and feel and have choice, be able to do it a different way in that moment. It's automatic. So now, close your eyes and invite now your other side to participate. And we're going to begin with the, with the washing movement because it's a little easier. So imagine now that you're going to bring this hand onto your face and before you even take the hand up, you're going to think about the movement. Think about the movement of bringing your hand up towards your face and how the palm of the hand is going to change position from where it is, maybe on your thigh, to face your hand, uh, to, fa to face your face, and you're going to look at it. So begin by doing that simply like the beginning of the movement, not even the whole thing, just, just the beginning, which is turning your palm up. If you notice any anxiety or stress, just breathe into this, relax your teeth and slow down your breath. Now your palm is up and you're lifting and you're looking at it. Simply that and put it down. You're turning the palm up. You're looking at it. It's eventually going to come all the way up to your face, but right now you're more interested in the movement itself than the outcome. And now once the hand is here, you get ch choice. Remember we did this a, a while ago, a few sessions ago, where, where we talked about Feldenkrais being reversible, meaning when you're here, you can choose, oh, I'm going to now wash my face, or actually I'm going to scratch my hand, or I'm going to fix my hair, or I'm going to simply look at my ring and put the hand down. So see if you can feel that difference. The hand that goes to wash your hand has one choice possible. It's committed. It's off the cliff. Now, because you're slowing it, you suddenly, first thing that happens is you have choice. And you go, oh wow, now I can fix my eyebrow, my hair, scratch. Right, so now multitude of choices are available and put, put it down and observe that. See if you can be in awe for a moment of that. Slowing down, the first thing we get there is choice. Now, let's do the movement with the right hand again of washing your face, imaginary movement of washing your face and see what it feels like. Like really go back to that moment, you're in the morning, you're half asleep, you need to wash your face, you're throwing water at your face to wake up and see what it feels like, the way you always do it. Right? It's almost like hitting my face, I can feel it. How does it feel to you, the quality of it? Is there any pleasure there at all? Or is it just a repetitive motion that you know is gonna get you the result that you want? And now pause that and take the left hand and lift it and look at it and connect to the sensation of your fingers because now you have time and now put the hand there, decide use your choice to decide you want to wash your face and imagine that you can do it 
in this slowed down motion where you actually get to feel your eyes, your forehead, your cheek, and put it down. And notice the difference in sensation, what feels different, what feels, I would say, even better about doing it this way. It's the same reason why the slow eating improves the flavor of the food or silent eating or when you are able to listen to a friend without rushing into the next thought you get to hear more now let's try something different which is put both hands down and invite your two hands to come up and look at them and choose to learn a new way to wash your face in this case where both hands come up and you're gonna practice this hopefully today or tomorrow morning and you're doing it with both hands both hands and this is so rich if you don't do it often for your brain because if you're used to the one hand movement and it's so ingrained and then suddenly you do both hands just stay there for a moment it's a whole new experience of yourself and slowly come back down. I recommend this, especially if you do one-handed motions, to really feel the difference in your whole body for the cream on the face or the brushing, the cooking. So slow down, take what's one-handed motion into the other hand both hands, now you have three choices. And now sense and feel yourself, stop the movement, put the hand in your heart again, feel that beating, see if by any chance it's a little slower, know that you can change this with your breath. So even right now, if we were to breathe slower, we would slow it down. Let's try that. Take a deep breath and then slow the breath out. Feel the beat of the heart. Breathe in. Breathe out slowly. I just felt my neck align. Breathe in. We're using the breath to create more coherence in the heart. The heart slows down. Breathe in again. And now sense the rhythm of the heart. Sense your thoughts, the speed of them. And now let's come back to that movement of the arm reaching up and remember how you did it with the right side the fast right arm spinning up and now close your eyes and really simply get curious about the very first couple seconds of that movement so really lift enough that the hand separates from wherever is resting maybe right now your thighs and the initiation of the movement the first two seconds that's enough put the head down the hand down and do it again close your eyes and the first two seconds and truly pay attention to the movement is your shoulder blade lifting or going down your shoulder blade is behind you. And if you need to, if you can't feel it, put your other hand on top of the shoulder and really pay attention as you lift the hand in the direction of up, but only a couple seconds, only lifting, say, 
of the the thigh and coming down notice if your shoulder blade is going down or coming up and if your shoulder top here the top of the shoulder blade is lifting or not and chances are that if you do this slowly the shoulder blade is going down and it's not coming up because it's just the beginning of the movement and now take it far a little further now lift the elbow up keep the shoulder down and that's it this is a second approximation we call it in Feldenkrais we speak of approximations baby steps so now lift the hand and the elbow and it's not a timid like me no 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 we're choosing we're choosing to slow this down and really feel what happens when the arm lifts and if you can't feel or sense because your awareness is not that developed put your hand the other hand is a witness put it there say under the ribs under the armpit on the ribs under the armpit and as you lift your hand observe this rib, ribs begin to spread up and now this movement of raising the arm is so nuanced right we're driving this this road 10 miles an hour we can feel so much the hand the wrist the elbow the shoulder the ribs more ribs ah it's so smooth so smooth that if you have any habitual tension you're going to feel your muscle just clamping because it doesn't know how to slow down so that's the work now once come back to resting take a moment feel your heart still slow because we're not rushing through this teaching and now once just for contrast let's do the automatic dominant arm raising up me I want that me and see if in that motion you can feel anything about the shoulder the elbow the wrist the ribs me it feels to me like a whiplash it doesn't feel so great it's probably very efficient it might get me the first prize and now let that go close your eyes so we can sense more within and slowly lift the palm of the hand, the, the leg and put it down and begin to tune in as if you were looking for a radio station that you like. Tune in to the sensations now in your bones, in your wrist, your elbow, until you feel your shoulder blade and your ribs and maybe make four steps, five steps baby steps putting the hand down again and eventually reach and then decide well I'm actually going to scratch first because I can because I have choice and then I'm going to keep going and say yes I want that and feel the difference in the sensation in your arm and do that again a couple times maybe with eyes open if you can just lift the hand scratch if you want to keep going and notice that it might feel to you if you look at me doing it that this is more graceful graceful it may seem to you that this is more harmonious or look like a dance movement right then so what is it like for you feel it in your own self which one do you like best and which one feels easier actually in the joints coming back to this idea that we are an organism and if you only place effort in one part you're gonna wear and tear that joint but if you are able to distribute the work remember we use that principle in a different live session you're gonna feel less wear and tear because the work is evenly spread among the whole side 
So now close your eyes and feel the difference between the arm that was moving fast and the arm that was moving slow. And see now that because it feels easier and smoother and less painful, you can speed it up, maintaining your attention to how are we doing it. So now instead of doing it in four or five baby steps, just do one step all the way up. But not, ah, not a whiplash, but same pathway. Attention, the hand, the wrist, the elbow, the ribs, and back all the way and see that even your whole side of that hip can lift faster maintaining that smoothness faster 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 my whole side is participating meanwhile the other one that only knows how to move fast is snapping out of the joint can you see the difference can you feel it in yourself now Feel the whole two sides and even that leg. And what is more connected? Which side is more connected? The one that we efficiently move so fast that almost feels like, ah, uh, wants to fall out? Or the one that is being integrated by slowest, slow processing first of what was going on? And how is it all interconnected? Now for the sake of, sake of time, we're not gonna take this onto the floor, but I invite you to do it in the space that you're in, just walking around a little bit. Same idea. So stand up and look across the room for something that you may want to go get. Like right now I'm looking at a pile of books and I could go and get one of them and speedily go and get that book or that object in your house. Just go and grab it and come back. And I'm not going to demonstrate this because I want to stay here on camera, but you can feel yourself busily getting there as fast as you know how or in your typical walk and feel yourself and hear the pounding of your feet on the ground and the sensation on your joints or if you don't want to walk around say something say a phrase read something or repeat a phrase you know really fast use your voice and sense yourself as you do that. And now come back to the beginning point and look at the same place and now really take time to take steps in that direction but not necessarily needing to get there. But see that you can take a step, maybe pause, look around, Take another step, see if you can feel your feet on the ground. Sense the temperature in the room. Take another step. Almost as if you're in walking meditation. So that's as slow as you can make it. Remember, much like when we did all the steps for the arm reaching up. Maybe go backwards and then go forwards again and really get your brain curious about all the choice that is built in this moment. Between point A and point B, I got the book, I got the object, I got the water, I picked that up from the floor, whatever it is you're up to all the little micro moments that are built in as opportunities to choose, to breathe, to sense your surroundings, to sense yourself. Remember, we're talking about being in relationship. So how many relationships 
can you exquisitely experience and presence be present to as you take this slow path towards the object of your desire right now so if there's a relationship with your desire and your intention with your breath and your organs if you can feel them your steps in the floor the space around you your ability to get there because you can because you can move any other object that might be on the way or distracting you from your desire. You're letting go of eventually getting there, exercising the choice to change your mind and go somewhere else. Eventually getting there and feeling it in your hand and looking at it and delighting in the moment where you get it. Right, so look at all the moments, all the steps, all the opportunities for awareness, presence, expansion, delight. And that's simply one example. We can do multiple examples of this as you savor each word in that sentence. Especially, especially if you're saying something to somebody else. Or processing a feeling. Or a memory. So let's take one more example. We have a little more time. Take one more example. And now come back to this. You can do it on the floor if you want to lie down or sitting on the chair. Take one example where we are uh, remembering something. Let's say somebody said something that made you feel a certain way. So we work with the, the, the presence of the body and the mind. And now we're working more with the emotions. So now somebody said something and you're processing really fast. Let's say, I'm going to give you an example from, from life, from my own life. I invited a couple of friends that I really enjoyed to do something together, to collaborate on a project. And they, they initially said, oh, I love the idea. Great, great. Love the idea. We'll get back to you. We'll get something going. We want to use this momentum. Nothing happened. I proposed a few dates to come back together haven't heard back. So if I process that really fast, what's most likely to happen is that I'm going to feel rejected. I'm going to feel left out. I might even go down the rabbit hole of downward emotions and feel betrayed or lied to or who knows, right? Depending on all the possible beliefs and trauma that I may be carrying with me, I can make that into hell. Now, what if I slow down that processing right now? And I really, and please take my story as an opportunity to look for a memory for yourself of something that you can choose to process really fast and make a one-to-one -one conclusion. And most likely the trauma, unhealed trauma, shadow, hurt, wound, call it whatever you want, part of you is going to, jump at that it's like that dominant arm that that knows exactly how to do things so it's going to rush through it and get it done and show up there first okay so instead allow ourselves to have the grace it's actually grace with oneself the art of slowing down gives you a lot of grace process that a little slower so breathing into it I get to see, oh, so many thoughts are wrapped there, like, like a 
yarn ball that is all tangled, like there, there's a thought of what actually happened and what I wish did happen that didn't happen. And there's a thought in the emotion of how it made me feel when that happened. And some of those thoughts are true and some of them are not. So now suddenly I begin to see, oh wow, there's so much there. And as you slow down this process and you stand in one thought or one emotion, you can question it. You can see if it's true or not. You can decide to attach to it and repeat it until it's beaten into you or drop it. Stand in the next thought and the next feeling. Is that true? How does that make me feel? Could I have changed that? Is it in my responsibility to change? Or maybe it's about them. Maybe they're not ready. Maybe they're not truthful with what they say and do or what to do, or right? Maybe it has nothing to do with me. So see what we're doing in this slow processing is to see more nuance, see more detail in the, in the picture, create a little bit of space. And suddenly there's a lot of choice now. I can choose to feel betrayed, feel abandoned, feel rejected, feel unseen. I can choose to feel neutral, to feel compassion, to feel understanding, to feel excitement because maybe that was not a good idea, not meant to be another space, another right relationship, the right collaboration will come, you see? But most importantly, observe how does it make you feel when you allow yourself a little more space, a little more time to process something that you put in the box that, oh, they don't want me. Ugh. Mm. Right? Sad, grief, that old wound of rejection comes back up, which I have. I don't know which one you have but I have a rejection, abandonment wood from my childhood that I'm ever so healing. Each time is easier, but it's always there, like your scars. I mean, you can have plastic surgery, but you still had that injury, right? You still had that wound. So it gets easier, but I would never say, oh, I'm we're done healing, all good. So feel the difference between getting stuck in that one-to-one -one fast processing this is what that means old wounds reacting or now there's more options here and i get to relive that whenever i want to and choose maybe a different solution for that riddle maybe it's like well maybe not now maybe later maybe in the summer maybe next year you see how does that make me feel I feel a lot happier. <laughs> Personally, I feel like there's a lot more joy possible than if I go, mm, that means they don't want me. Mm. That's just one hole that I get to dig myself into. So please, as you contemplate all this and pass it through your heart and hopefully put it in your body as you move your arms and whatnot, how does this feel? How does this resonate with you? Do you find it useful? I would really love to hear in the chat if even one of these many thoughts I'm sharing or opportunities to practice feels curious. You get curious about, hmm, I never thought of that. Let me see how would it work? Because if that's the case, then I've succeeded at capturing your curiosity and your imagination. And then you're gonna play with it. That's how children learn. That's the art of learning, actually. It's learning how to learn, how to get curious about something, look for an opportunity to practice it, see how it feels, see if it works. Did you find a difference in your arm? For me, the biggest today was that when I slowed down the arm movement, I really enjoyed my whole body moving. I really did. How about you?
Erin Marie shared earlier that slipped and fell in my house a few days ago because I turned the corner too fast and I have a bruise to remind me to slow down. That's exactly it. And I love that you have a bruise to remind you because a lot of times we don't get visible reminders. All these things kind of go unnoticed. So how do you remember? I took a spill walking the trail this week, reminder to slow down, scrape my leg, ouch. You have a scrape to remind you now. Now, what if we could, because we're so, even though sometimes the reminders are not visible, we are so wired to remember negative experiences, uh, mistakes, so we don't do them again, right? That's an um, evolutionary trait, actually, is helping us. Mm avoid danger next time to remember, oh, if I go that way, I'm gonna get hurt, so rather not. So we're, it's useful to remember everything that we shouldn't do again. <laughs> I touch the, touch the stove, I'm gonna get burned, right? So it's useful. Now, can we cultivate really like a garden? Cultivate meaning planting, watering, pruning, harvesting, right? It's a process, it takes time, it takes repetition, it takes attention. Can we cultivate remembering what works? Not only what to avoid, but remembering what is beneficial, remembering that certain practices connect us to ourselves. Because what I notice too is when we get these practices going and then we get into a better space and a better groove, a better sense with ourselves, I'm not falling, I'm not scraping, I'm not dropping things, I'm more aware, I'm more present, I feel better in my body. And then I forget it. I forget the practices that got me there because they're working. It's so human to forget the beneficial ways that we're learning. So right now, for example, I'm really thirsty. I'm gonna drink some water, right? I don't remember enough that water is really, really, really good for me. So how can I remember? How can you remember? And the easiest way that I know to remember is to make a positive reinforcement association with the practice. So for me, when I drink the water, if I want to remember, I have to slow down enough to pay attention to how the water feels as it's going down and it feels like it's really nurturing and, and bringing more fluid and more flow. I can feel it going all the way down. So I notice that and I go, hmm, that feels good. I'm gonna remember to do that. I'm going to put it in front of me and when I look at it, I will remember how it feels and go for it, for example, right? So same with these little practices, is next time you're in front of the mirror washing your face, take the time. Take the time to slow down the motion of your hands reaching for your face and really using maybe both hands if you're only one-handed. That's the biggest contrast for the brain, feeling suddenly both sides taken care of at the same time. And that goes a long way because you might do it again simply because it felt so good. You see what I mean? When I read the comments, such a beautiful practice. Thank you, dear Angela. Thank you so much. Super excited to play with slowing down. This is amazing. So helpful. Pause and ask if it's true. Thank you so much. Yes, this is great. Yeah, that's the beautiful work of Byron Katie. If you don't know her, look her up. Byron Katie. And she has a simple process called the work, which is four questions. It's free. It's such a gorgeous self-inquiry work. It will take a lot of suffering away from your life. I use it in my private practice all the time. I work one-on-one -on -one and I work in groups. And please look at my website if you want to learn more, okay? I'm out on a walk and slowing down changes everything. Drinking in my experience. Yes, exactly, Noni. Thank you for sharing that. You slow down and suddenly you are connected to everything. 
to yourself, to nature, or the sidewalk, the sense of your feet kissing the earth as you walk, like Tich Nhat Han says, your neighbors, the feel, feelings and sensations of the breeze on your face, your own heartbeat, relationships with everything change instantly, instantly. Nancy says, I've been meditating for years, tried not to react so quickly, to pause first, but I still react when I feel I'm being judged. Maybe thinking about my body slowing down will help. Nancy, you bring up a perfect example. Thank you for saying that. Because sometimes, if you're doing something consistently and you don't see results, it means, and if you look at my website, there's more information about this. I cannot take so much time to explain today. It means that that's not your entry point. You can sit in meditation for years and you may not find the result right away because maybe that's not the way for you to get in faster. Remember, we want to create a difference that we can feel right away. So that might be your body. And maybe your body now has less resistance because it's new, because you never tried it. And then you go, oh, wow, this, this feels different in my body. Now, where else can I play with this? And now you apply it to how to use judgment. Because judgment is inevitable. That, my 13-year-old daughter already knows that. She says, mommy, stop in judgment, not going to happen. You're constantly judging all the time. That's what we do. The big question is, what do we do with that judgment? So let's say you judge somebody else. Well, that's somebody else. It's part of you. We are connected. So can I see what I don't like in that person as maybe something I'm rejecting off of myself? Right? That's a whole emotional work that we could do together if you want to. Right now, all I can say about that is, is, is in the rejection that the misopportunity is in the pushing away and the resistance. Remember, there's only two motions here. We talked about it maybe the first session. And by the way, most of the sessions are on my, my website, the replays. So the motion of toward, coming toward, pulling in, leaning in, or the motion of awareness, pushing away. Those are the two motions here in the universe, in ourselves. So everything you push away, reject, resist, is a missed opportunity. Unless it's a boundary, unless it's something that you say, no, I'm not, this is not good for me, I'm not participating in that. What else do I have for us today? Um, I think I, I have an invitation to observe yourself as you go through the day with a lot of compassion when you find yourself rushing. So how to practice this as we wrap up and about to close the session is, if you now that you have all this information and, and really felt the difference, if you notice that you are um, rushing through life more than you wish, please be kind with yourself. Please observe that as you would look at a child that is learning how to walk and know that this child needs time and it's going to go through a series of stages and eventually pull up maybe some furniture or an adult or something and, and feel his feet, her feet and go, oh, wow, right? And maybe take some stumbling steps, but there's nothing you can do to rush that process. Even if you say, here, I'll help you that baby needs to go through those steps. So you wouldn't blame the baby or f say, oh, this dumb baby, like he can't walk yet. No, we're not giraffes, we're not deer. We don't come out of the, my, our mother's womb just walking and running. We take our time. Learning in humans takes time. So with compassion, if you can look at where you are in that process and say, wow, look at, I now know that I'm rushing through and can I find one opportunity to practice something new? And I do it with myself all the time because I'm catching myself all the time. So I'm by no means 
I've mastered this and I'm interested in mastering it, this art. And even before mastering the art of slowing down, you want to master the art of awareness and knowing what you're doing. And awareness will invite you to kindness and compassion. It's the only way. Because if what you notice what you're doing, you shut down and you feel bad and you begin to punish yourself for being that way, you'll create a huge amount of resistance to anything new. So that's not the way. Okay? Other than this, I have only gratitude, much gratitude for you. I don't want to share any more content because we had a long session. So if you have any questions, reach out to me personally. See you next time. I love you. You are a beautiful being and thank you for spending your time with me. I really appreciate it. Okay? Have a beautiful week and weekend and I'll see you in two weeks. Same time, same place. Thank you so much for your attention. Mwah. Much love. Bye, dears. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. And don't forget to subscribe. See you in the next video.